So thank you everyone and welcome for, uh, to uh, today's webinar. Before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of countries throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to elders, past, present and emerging. So in today's webinar, we'll be talking all about maximizing or optimizing the value of your workforce and organization structure. We'll be covering a number of aspects around restructure, turnarounds and transactions, as well as the role of HR in this whole process. We know very much that the pandemic has thrown up a whole range of challenges for businesses all around the world. Um, and one of the questions that everyone is asking and trying to solve for is how we got the right organization structure to help us get through the market and economic impacts of the pandemic, as well as position us strongly for the rebound. So we'll get to unpack this question and a whole lot more today. This webinar forms part of a new series of webinars to help you reinvent your shape of work in the coming months as we come out of the initial reactionary phases of COVID-19. So there's going, to, there's going to be a webinar every fortnight for the next two months covering topics such as remuneration and managing labor costs, the new face of leadership, employee experience, flexible working, uh, critical talent and skills and transformation as well. And so if these are of interest, please make sure you sign up for them and we'll send some information following uh, this webinar for you to do so. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our panel today. Uh, we have Ronan Gilholy, our strategy leader for M&A at our sister company, Oliver Wyman. We have Ben Haste, our people and organizations practice leader for Mercer Pacific and Leandro Rubiro, our M&A leader for Mercer Pacific. My name's Georgina Lee and I lead growth and experience for Mercer's talent reward and workforce consulting business. And I'll be leading a panel discussion with Ronan, Ben and Leandro to begin with, as well as answer a number of the questions that you had uh, pre-submitted. Uh, but don't forget that this is a live interactive discussion and so we'll be responding live to you. So if you can ask us your questions during this session using the question box below, um, we also have the chat function on Zoom. So please interact and engage with us to make this as rich as insightful as possible for you. So you can engage with us uh, during this session using the three buttons below that you will see the Q&A box to post a question to the speakers. You'll be able to see the other questions that other um, uh, audience members write. And so if there's a question that comes up that relates to your organization as well, you can vote uh, that question and it will put that question um, higher up on the list and I will prioritize those. Uh, we're not using the raise hand function today, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, and you can use the chat box if you want to share your experiences with everyone. Um, and please, when you do write a message in there, please share to all panelists and attendees so everyone can see your comment. So before I start, I usually like to do a little quick warm up just to get you used to using the interactions. Um, if you can uh, open up the chat box and let us know where you're joining us from today. Um, and also if you're comfortable sharing what industry you work in, um, that way we can get a sense of who's in the room. Great, Alison from Melbourne in the sports industry. We've got professional services, financial services, wine industry. Awesome. We've got universities, resources, pharmaceutical, not for profits, disability sector. Wow, very diverse industries. Awesome, thank you very much for that. So you're used to the chat function now. Um, and if you have a question, please put it in the Q&A box. That, that way I won't uh, accidentally miss it. All right, cool. Well, with that, I might kick off the panel discussion. Um, might start with you, Ronan. Um, we're hearing stories of companies restructuring left, right and centre, and unfortunately lots of job losses as well we're hearing in the news every single day. And depending on the industry you're in, COVID-19 has and will continue to make a significant impact on businesses. So in your recent observations, what have been some of the main issues driven by COVID-19 that have led to these restructures? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think our general view is that COVID-19 is not creating a new normal, it's merely accelerating existing underlying trends in the market. 
Mm. And uh, in our view across every industry, the dominant issue or impact seems to be around digital, digital acceleration. And, I, and in my view, that takes three different forms. One is an acceleration in change of consumer behavior around consumption patterns. So in retail, a greater propensity to engage online, obviously from a business perspective as we're doing today, rather than physically traveling, uh, engaging in video conferencing. And so acceleration of digital engagement, getting together with family and house parties, uh, and a more flippant example is a reality, which was a trend that was already there. And so those organizations that had better pivoted to digital and consumer engagement or digital engagement with their business partners uh, have proven to be a little bit more resilient in their ability to sort of lean into that change and that business model and survive and thrive in the current environment than those who haven't. I think uh, the second impact or influence we see is something of an acceleration in digital challenges. Uh, digital challenges of digital native businesses across a range of different industries tend to be a little more agile uh, in terms of how they operate. They don't have legacy physical infrastructure. They don't have broad workforce, et cetera. And so obviously when you get into a lockdown scenario, uh, as we're experiencing in Melbourne at the moment, lockdown has a fairly significant impact on uh, store-based or network-based labor, by example, on physical store operations. And so we tend to find that uh, digital disruptors tend, or digital native businesses tend to be a little bit more agile on their responsiveness to the current environment than those organizations that have a large physical infrastructure. I think the third and last uh, observation on an impact of the current situation is actually on an acceleration of change within organizations. So what we've seen previously is um, the adoption of automation, the upskilling of individuals, uh, a greater propensity and focus in traditional industries and the adoption of data analytics skills, by example. And so organizations seeking to both better automate and better make use of available data within the organization. When we think about organizations who are responding to the current market situation, clearly a large number of organizations and a large number of industries have gone into shutdown and either furloughed or stood down their staff. Um, for those organizations that have sort of taken the view to not waste a good crisis. In the main, uh, their project focus has been around digital automation and uh, embracing a number of those digital opportunities. So sort of three key areas of focus for you like around different business models, those who survive consumer behavior and internal operations tend to be the sort of three dynamics, but each center in this idea of digital impact. Yeah, and in addition to the, I guess, the digital aspects of things, how, how are organizations approaching restructures generally? Um, so there's some very different schools of thought on restructures depending on the circumstance of the organization. So um, if we think of reorganization in the sort of two by two, two dimensions, if you like, we have the idea of organizations that are reacting to a financial imperative, distress, lack of cash, and those organizations who are being proactive and looking ahead at what market environment and demand is going to be in the medium to long term and how the organization positions for that. So reactive and proactive tends to define the way in which organizations approach a restructure activity. The second dimension is, is whether an organization is thinking about incremental change or profound and fundamental change. Um, and so we tend to find that where organizations are having to react to a cash crisis, they're taking more of a blunt instrument uh, to restructure. And it's very much a fiscally driven lens on a business in looking at line item by line item, the cost base of an organization. Where organizations are thinking about more profound or proactive change, which is around transforming their operating model, it tends to be a more considered approach, which is led by thinking about the business model of the organization and its role in the market, thinking about the operating model and how it conducts itself and thinking about organization design. So two extremes, if you like, and how organizations are approaching it, but both tend to be a function of the situation the organization finds itself in. Mm. Yeah, thanks, Ronan. And Ben, um, with any you know, restructuring program, there's likely to be people impacted, which is you know, the devastating part. And organizations will look at the label cost, labor costs line item of the cost base, as Ronan just mentioned. How do organizations approach the subject of headcount reduction particularly? And how do you balance economics with empathy here? Thanks, George. <clears throat> look, it is, look, it's very challenging. You know, people cost is 
most often the most significant cost line, you know, apart from some asset intensive industry. So organizations really need to face into it, you know, fundamentally as being a very challenging thing to do. Um, as Ronan said, I think it's the more proactive organizations, you know, whether that's you know, incremental or fundamental change um, that are doing it better. Um, and look, they've realized that, you know, the, you know, the people cost is, it's very costly to um, remove that cost and it's very costly to reinstate it. So um, the impact is enormous. Um, I think it's a bit of a balancing of top down and bottom up. So as you know, Ronan said, you know, the top down piece around the future business strategy, the future business model, the future operating model, you know, informed by, you know, the right organization design principles is critical, but then building it needs to be from the bottom up, you know, from, from the line, you know, line accountability for uh, building it um, and executing on it. Um, you know, the line knows the business best um, and the line knows, you know, how to run a profitable future business model and how to organize to do so. So it has to be a very open process and an involving process from that perspective, but balanced with that top down um, perspective as well. But it's, there's no denying it's, 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 it's fundamentally a very challenging you know, and emotive process. And is headcount reduction the only answer here? Look, it's not the only answer, but it, it's, it, it's, it's part of the answer because it's part of the overall future business model and future operating model. So, um, but it needs to be looked at holistically you know, with other costs and you know, broader cost transformation. So not in isolation, um, but it, it is part of the overall answer, you know, depending on what that you know, future business model is and a future operating model is, you know, there's no denying that, um, but it should be looked holistically with you know, all other costs. So. Hmm. Yeah. And perhaps Leandro, uh, from your perspective, um, as organizations, you know, design that cost reduction, what elements of thinking can HR bring into these considerations? Thanks, Jordan. Uh, I think uh, in this context that's been planted, um, you know, uh, cost reduction, human research can uh, support in different ways uh, to avoid headcount reductions. You know? There are some uh, more common strategies like redeployment, for example, it's a very effective way to retain employees and cost control. Um, HR, uh, can, instead of just cut salary, like reveal the compensation benefits packages according to the market practice and kind of calibrate it uh, on a more realistic picture line with the market. Uh, companies can localize expats uh, to reduce costs as well. Uh, temporary leaving, um, flexible work arrangement also uh, to reduce costs. Like for example, some specific areas with excess of capacity working three, four times a week instead of five. And these are like more uh, common uh, things, but some, some new ideas raised uh, with this pandemic, like temporary talent sharing as well, you know, uh, is something that more companies with redundancy are considering, where corporations with excess of capacity, like retail, entertainment, transportation industry, can share talents with other corporations with higher demand due to this pandemic, like food, retail, technology, personal care. Yeah, and once a decision for restructure has been made, what, what is the role of HR in supporting that change and how can they best support the organization? Yeah, in, in my opinion, I think first, uh, I, I think like Ben said, uh, it's important to highlight that restructuring and cost containment does not, it doesn't mean you have to only reduce headcount, you know? is the first thing. The second thing uh, is um, in a restructuring environment, HR needs to be more strategic and less operational. You know? uh, like Ronan said, like more proactive and less reactive. Uh, and in order to do it, uh, whatever the business strategy is, and whatever strategy you have in your corporation, human resources need to understand very well the rationale of the restructuring and build and connect uh, a people strategy to support uh, the final objective. Okay? For example, uh, if a corporation decides to sell a division, you know, what's the rationale behind this decision? Uh, 
uh, can be like raise cash, can be maybe focus on my core business, maybe uh, the division is not performing. Or if the objective is a joint venture or a partnership, what's the rationale behind the decision? Is the company looking for scale? Is the company looking for scope? So uh, what is the final objective the business is seeking uh, with this restructure? For each one of these examples, uh, depending on the answer, the people strategy will be completely different. So HR, to be strategic, need to understand the rationale and create people strategies to support uh, this transformation. Okay? So this is the second one. And the third is, uh, is the employee experience. It's important to balance economic decision uh, with people value in HR. And HR is, is, is also key here. You know, make sure you have right people in the right place. Uh, I've seen examples of companies in distress where the communication with people is not very effective. So try to enhance the employee experience by communicating properly, hearing employees and being transparent. So, mm. yeah. yeah, so it sounds like HR really brings in that human element, ensuring that whatever outcomes of a restructure from a people perspective is, is thought about um, in a considerate manner and, and done in the right way. Um, I guess the question right now is, you know, obviously COVID-19, we, we don't know the extent of the economic impact. Um, is there a way of, you know, doing something more temporarily? And restructure, restructure often comes with more longer term permanent change to an organisation. So Ronan, maybe this question is for you. Um, how could organisations restructure their business momentarily? Is, is, can, can they do that just to ride out the pandemic and see what happens afterwards? Uh, yes, or to an extent, I suppose, is the, is the answer to that. I think generally, and you've just touched on it yourself, the conversation we talk about restructuring typically uh, is a conversation about the cost base of an organization. Uh, and it's, it's quite surprising the extent to which in times of distress or in times of focusing on margin improvement, organizations go straight to the cost base of the organization. Um, so a, a sort of gentle thought for most organizations is to put a little more emphasis on um, the top line drivers of the business itself. So in the short to medium term, what I mean in reality around that is thinking about things such as the product or offer of the business. So rationalizing a product portfolio, cutting the tail or thinking about improvements in product innovation as a case in point. Uh, thinking about um, pricing, so in services, financial services, businesses, we tend to think about front book versus back book pricing and opportunities to revisit pricing architecture. Uh, temporarily, if you're sitting in retail or consumer goods, uh, what we have seen is a reasonable degree of focus on trade spend and promotional spend at this point in time as practical levers organizations can pull, which both influence top line performance, but also have margin implication. Uh, last but not least, uh, the greatest of all untouchables in the cost base of an organization tends to be its marketing spend. And what we have seen, again, following the philosophy of not wasting a good crisis, is several organizations use the organizational capacity at this point in time to revisit some of the marketing spend, in particular with some of that standard spend us in standby, and rethink the effectiveness of the return on marketing investment they're doing. So point number one would be um, counterintuitively in a restructure, some of the most immediately available levers to an organization are the levers least looked at which is what drives the top line performance of a business. The second, uh, and getting more to the core of where organizations do tend to focus around uh, costs, is typically this euphemism of variabilizing my cost base. And what variabilizing my cost base means in reality is where I'm thinking about fixed assets for the assets sit on the balance sheet. Is there an opportunity for sale or lease back? Is there an opportunity to exit or renegotiate leases? Is there an opportunity to uh, flex longer term contracts to shorter term contract positions? And when we think about people, we get into a slightly more uh, problematic and difficult to execute conversation in the short term, which is how can I variableize the cost base of my people? The challenge in doing so is typically the real and obvious constraint of employment contracts. Um, I think Leandro just touched on it. Variableizing workforce can mean moving to different hour-based arrangements, different um, uh, different employment constructs, or in extreme circumstances, thinking about changing the boundary of an organization. 
to put greater emphasis on third party or contracted supply rather than in-house labor supply. So uh, right now, I think a heavy, heavy focus for a number of organizations as they look forward in the next 12 to 18 months is the inherent uncertainty of demand and actually understanding what the right cost base and the most appropriate cost base for the organization will be as organizations ramp back up from stood down to full capacity and how an organization can actually manage the step ups in its cost base. So this conversation about variabilizing a cost base is a very active dialogue in many of our clients at this point in time, more easily said than done, in particular where you've got product supply chain oriented businesses uh, in service oriented businesses, the real challenge therefore is how you deal with your workforce in achieving that. Yeah, so it sounds like you know, lots of levers to pull, lots of different variables. Um, in your experience, what do you think good looks like versus what bad looks like? And, um, you know, who will be the winners down the line, depending on the approach they take now? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it, it's a good question. And I think it's, it's a bit of a nuanced answer. In, uh, in reality, I think you've got to think through the hierarchy of needs of an organization. And if we think of the bottom of a hierarchy of needs, at the very bottom of an organization's hierarchy is cash. Does the organization have enough cash? Is it adding to its cash balance and servicing its debt needs or is it burning its cash balance? And the response of an organization and uh, the brutality, if I can use that word, with which an organization approaches restructuring is actually going to be a function of the financial standing of the business. So as I alluded to earlier, when I talked about reactive restructuring and, and profound restructuring, where organizations are facing the prospect of insolvency or the prospect of administration, we tend to find a more finance function driven approach to restructuring, which is an imperative to take cost out of the business in order to survive. Um, so that's, that's what a distress restructure looks like. Mm -hmm. The surprising observation is in normal times when organizations need to react to an earning shortfall or need to tighten the belt from a cost perspective, many organizations take exactly the same approach, which is a finance led approach. Um, a, a better a more mature approach is exactly as Ben alluded to previously, which is understanding the healthy balance between the top down financial imperative on what an organization needs to achieve and involving and engaging the frontline staff in the business and the business unit owners who actually understand the reality of how a business needs to deliver what it needs to deliver. So if we take a, a, a very given function, it's fairly common for organizations to put out a percentage cost reduction edict on particular elements of its workforce or particular functions, a more intuitive and informed approach to the same would be to understand what the function actually does and whether processes or activities can be changed, stopped or started or outsourced, whatever the answer may be, in order to achieve that outcome. So we typically advocate in a restructure process that understanding what needs to change is just as important as understanding the financial outcome it delivers in order to have a better restructure experience. Yeah, that's yeah, that's really I agree with that. And um, Leandro, uh, from an HR perspective, you know, we've we've seen good approaches to it as well as uh, not so good approaches to it. Um, from your experience, what what can you um, add to maybe you know what's good and bad about restructuring? Yeah, yeah I think uh, again uh, from an HR standpoint, you know, in a restructuring environment or an m a transaction uh, human resource is normally the last function to be involved you know for example like finance legal it it has been changing uh, but unfortunately uh, it is a reality and this is what looks bad for me you know what bad looks like for me <laughs> on the other hand uh, i have seen different cases where hr leaders uh, were able to give a turnaround on this reality by showing to the board what are the economic impacts, uh, uh, what what economic impacts can generate uh, can be generated from from this uh, potential people issues, and connecting a compelling people strategy to support the business, business objective. So that's what uh, the good looks like for me. You know, this these two extremes. Yeah, and do, would you have an example of like, I guess like a good 
you know, people strategy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, an HR, uh, when you have an ex uh, restructuring or an MA transaction, you all, always need to come back to the rationale of the transaction and understand what is going on to link uh, your people's strategies uh, to the final objective. So, for example, if you if you are uh, buying uh, selling uh, now in a restructuring reality, uh, many companies are divesting uh, some part of their business. You know, so what's the rationale? Do I need to raise cash? So, okay, if I need to raise cash, me as a human resource leader, I need to make sure the value of this transaction will be very very high until the day one, you know? So I need to make sure I won't lose any, any key talents in this transaction. I need to make sure all the people strategies are connected with the final objective. That's what I mean, you know? So, uh, so each one of the, uh, each difference you have in the original rationale will change how you build and connect your people strategy to, to make sure the value uh, keep the same uh, as a, the business priority. Does that make sense? Yeah, thanks, Leandro. And Ben, did you have anything to add in terms of what good or bad looks like? Um, I, I think on reflection, yeah, building on what Ronan said, that what I've seen that is good and works well is a number of things. One is that that I guess it's that top-down alignment from the executive down to down to say executive general management level on the future business model, the future operating model. Um, you know, clearly aligned and clarified on that. Um, genuine involvement of the line, um, bottom up, um, in decision making. And then in terms of HR, I guess, you know, we, we talk about, you know, bringing empathy into it. I think that where HR has played a very objective role, you know, in assessment, um, in selection, you know, uh, in looking at capability and people, um, those three things are where I've seen it work particularly well. Um, it's not easy either um, to get that. Um, and so, you know, I can think of a specific example, an oil and gas client that was fundamentally changing its operating model from a functionally led to an asset led model, having those three things occurring uh, in short, a very effective process. But it is challenging, George. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, so I'd like to just maybe move on to some of the submitted questions that we got um, as you registered for this webinar. So we've got a few of those. And so I um, might uh, direct this first one to Ronan. Um, how much organizational design should be done by the business themselves and how much should it be left to the, I guess, experts? Depends on who we mean by experts, right? Um, I think, uh, well, a good starting point should be that no client, no organization should abrogate uh, ownership of a strategy and organization design exercise to, to sort of third parties. Um, uh, I think the, it goes back to the point that I think Ben and I have both touched on before, that, that actually good organization design and good change should actually be done in tandem, uh, where um, the business, the line management, the executive's response for a business uh, and corporate stakeholders and executive team are equal stakeholders in a process. HR and finance are equal stakeholders in a process. I think one of the reasons why it's always useful to have outside challenge to an individual business is to get rid of availability bias. So uh, in a recent exercise we went through with a diversified portfolio company in uh, predominantly industrials, you have a lot of business units, you've got a lot of duplication of activity, you've got a relatively small head office function that effectively acts as a financial or portfolio manager. And the organization was uh, considering what the opportunity was for cost reduction through creation of shared services. The inevitable and healthy tension in the business is that people tend to have a desire to keep possession and keep control of functions that support their businesses. And so uh, that's a kind of a scenario where you need a brokered conversation to help people move beyond their biases. Uh, but by the same token, you can't achieve good as an outcome and organization design in that scenario by doing it to the business. It needs to be done with the full involvement of the business uh, so that people embrace and actually support the change journey that results from it. 
Yeah, and I've got a, a follow-on question to that now that you're talking about that. Obviously, you know, the, when organisations approach restructure, there tends to be, you know, a lot of secrecy around it, going, oh, you know, it, it sits in the leadership table. Uh, no one else knows what's going on until the restructure actually happens. How do you actually involve the organisation bottom-up in, in that restructuring conversation? Yeah, that's that's a, a very good question. <laughs> Again, I think there's there, there's no easy answer to that question. Is is the simple response? It, it depends a little on what the nature of the restructure is. So we'll typically advocate that a transformational restructure should be as much about the narrative of the business in the market, its consumers, and what the business wants to achieve in the long, as it is anchored in short-term financial imperatives. Uh, because while you're driving the change process, you need to give people in the business something to believe in, that the change has a higher purpose and we actually understand where we're going. So point number one would be thinking a little bit about the messaging of any transformation program and any restructure program on what it is we're trying to achieve. Uh, the reality is, and the unpleasant truth is where an organization is in financial distress and needs to take cost out and where labor cost is one of the largest uh, line items in the organization, uh, there's a benefit to being open and honest and as transparent as one can be to the organization around the situation and the necessity and, uh, and effectively communicating with empathy in doing so. There are uh, other situations perhaps where uh, it's better to do it in a staged approach. So I don't think there's one right answer to it. Uh, my personal view is that being as open as an organization can be tends to be a good philosophy to not to communicate anything externally you wouldn't wish to communicate internally and vice versa to make sure that um, anything you communicate internally in an organization you're happy to make its way externally. Yeah good advice um, and Ben what's the best way to approach people's capabilities into new roles that's also another question that we uh, got in pre-submitted and and before Ben if you before you um, answer that question if I can encourage people to if you've got any questions so far please put that in the Q&A box uh, we've got a bit of time after this uh, to to answer them as well so please do so um, all right Ben so yeah what's the best approach uh, uh, what's the best way to approach people's capabilities into new roles I think I might um, build on Ronan's answer. So, you know, for situations where you can have, I guess, less transparency or less involvement, you know, apart from the process, that alignment amongst the executive is critical. Um, where you can have more transparency and more involvement of the line in the process, you know, with future capabilities, it's, it's often a very ill understood, very uh, ill defined, surprisingly late in the process. So there's a process that, um, you know, and often advisors can help facilitate that in defining those future capabilities and objectively assessing them. And I guess like Rony made the point earlier, you know, the, the organization can't abrogate its responsibility, but you know, in, in situations like that, often roles we've played as advisors or external parties is facilitating that process. Um, often with HR, um, you know, and helping the, you know, the business and the line, you know, own those decisions. Um, and capabilities is a great example because they are, they are, apart from, you know, high level strategic capabilities, they're often very ill-defined in terms of what they mean for people um, and roles um, and what needs to be done. So, you know, objectively defining that and assessing that is, is critical. The more transparent, the more involvement you can have in the line, um, you know, and that takes effort and time and, you know, um, clearly managed process, um, but the better it is. I think the, yeah. the, maybe just one build on uh, Ben's point is uh, leading organizations um, ultimately realize that change is a constant. Markets are continuing to evolve, product portfolios are continuing to evolve. And so most organizations will have a degree of change continually present inside the organization. And so the constructive challenge to any organization that's grappling with how to engage uh, with its employee base in a change process is that that actually reflects the fact that organizations by inference must be standing still for a period of time before starting change. And so I think one of the pathways to getting around this issue 
is to actually think about transformation and think about change as a continual process within an organization and uh, to have it as a capability and a function so that uh, it actually becomes the norm inside an organization rather than a reaction to a market event. Yeah, so very much a muscle to build within the yeah. organization. And I guess that leads to uh, the, the third pre-submitted question around um, you know, organizations wanting to potentially benchmark their organizational restructural, I guess, approach with other uh, industry peers. Is it typical to do that or should that be not advised um, benchmarking is uh, a useful data point and it's an input into a process. Benchmarking is rarely, if ever, the answer. And so I think the challenge with benchmarking in truth is that it is a tool that's frequently misunderstood and misused. Uh, picking a benchmark from a different organization in a different situation uh, in a different geography with a different scale and applying it to one's own organization can be a very dangerous thing to do. That said, having available benchmarks around function size, by example, and function scope can be a useful guideline and an input to a decision-making process an organization needs to make. So in simple for me, benchmarking is valuable as an input into a process, but it shouldn't define a process. Yeah. I agree. Um, we haven't got any questions come in. Oh, actually, no, we do have one. Um, a question from Mel. Uh, how do you make it a make it the norm in organisations? And I'm assuming you mean by uh, you know having change and responding to change and having that muscle to to be a, agile with change is the norm. Um, I'm assuming that's what it means. Uh, Leandro, Ben, or Ronan, anyone have a uh, response to that? Maybe Ben. Look, I think I, I think of it in terms. It's 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 a broader cultural issue, and it's it's representative of the culture. So you know, the levers you look at around cultural transformation, executive role modelling, tone from the top, all of those sorts of things apply for um, for this. Yeah. And that's that's why it's very challenging, you know, um, all those aspects of cultural change that, that we know are challenging and that have to be worked on. But that's the way to make it a norm. You know, view it as a, you know, a cultural change, cultural transformation issue. Yeah, I mean, my, my only build on, on Ben's comment would be, I think it speaks somewhat to the rise of a chief transformation officer as a role or a, a type of job title, if you like. And so... I can think in the last five years in particular for larger organizations within Australia, it must be said, um, organizations that have stood up a transformation program in reacting to a situation and inevitably it's a, a profit shortfall, it's a cost driven issue or a market driven issue and have successfully driven a transformation program uh, have, I can think of an example in the retail industry, I can think of an example in the consumer goods industry, I can think of an example in the aviation industry, have then sustained that program and actually the program becomes a way of working inside the organization. So uh, the, the muscle, to use your language, is actually built by having a transformation program and then sustained into an ongoing body or program of work, which typically tends to broaden out over time uh, away from thinking about cost base towards true transformation, which can be digital enablement, it can be structural change, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, and just yeah, sure. to add, um, uh, we also see uh, many, uh, from the HR standpoint, um, um, many projects uh, leaders had in the pipeline, and it's really difficult uh, to push like a cultural transformation. Um, now it's a really good moment <laughs> Uh, to revisit you know, because people are very used to, to this, this uh, um, number of changes in their, in their um, you know, normal life, I understand, uh, in terms of communication style, uh, in terms of also uh, behaviors you know, uh, in the culture's perspective, like uh, I want to have a more collaborative uh, 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 corporation, a more uh, engagement or uh, decision making. Uh, so um, this is the opposite way, you know, uh, so I want to come back to the new norm, but how to 
really push some some specific change I would like to have in my culture. Uh, now it's, it's a very good time to think about it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I've got another question from Stephanie. Um, do you think the role of part-time and other flexible work will play an important role in helping businesses variableize their cost base? Or do you think organizations will continue to think the FT, think in FTE blocks as they restructure? Maybe something for you, Ben, and you know, others feel free to chime in. Um, yeah, I mean, look, you know, definitely in terms of variableizing the cost base, you know, contractors, you know, project roles, et cetera. I mean, there's challenges around labor law and contract law and, you know, issues around, you know, cultural issues around flexibility and roles that we see. Um, but yeah, definitely that is the case. Um, yeah, but, you know, FT and headcount is, you know, a, a blunt tool. So, it, you know, depends on, I guess, sophistication, you know, of the organization to the extent to which that will happen. Yeah. Anyone else want to add to that or we're good? We might need to wrap up too, if um, if we don't have any uh, last minute comments, we're a minute before end of the time. Um, we do have another question that's just come in and let's see if we can do it really quickly. Um, people are suffering with change fatigue and pace of continuous change slash transformation internally, as well as external factors such as COVID that leads to disengagement and people only being in it for the short term benefits. How long should an organization wait between organizational change and restructure? It's a good point. I mean, I, th I think I, I can pick up on that one because I think um, on one hand, change fatigue is a reality, but on the other hand, per my earlier comment, um, we see increasing institutionalization of transformation programs and a shift in many organizations to having project-based roles as well as line roles within an organization because of a greater propensity to want to take projects. So change fatigue is real, but, but it's an inevitable reality that most organizations need to continue to adapt and change to survive and thrive, or they don't. It's that simple. I think the difference between the two and the way in which you balance it is through uh, messaging and engagement on the purpose of a transformation. I think uh, most of us tend to realize that within a transformation, there may be losses and there may be consequences, but ultimately people can buy into a change pro uh, process if they understand the higher purpose, the higher purpose in terms of growth, in terms of being a good place to work, in terms of competitive advantage in the marketplace. So I think my, my main thought on that one is, I think whether we like it or not, unfortunately, many transformation programs and restructures are a euphemism for cost out. And I think that's what drives change fatigue. I think changing the tone, the messaging, and in fact, the focus of transformation programs, I think is an absolute prerequisite to making it more sustainable. Yeah, really good point. Thank you. And thank you for that question. Um, all right, well, we're a little bit, we're now a minute past uh, the 45 minute mark. So I might wrap up quickly here. So I just wanna thank everyone for coming to today's webinar. Uh, if you missed the initial intro, um, this is a, uh, part of a series of new webinars over the next couple of months, helping you invent this new world, shape of work. And so if you're interested in a number of the topics, please sign up to our uh, webinars. There's gonna be one every two weeks. Uh, we'll be sending an email around after this to uh, share any additional resources, uh, as well as uh, links to um, register for future webinars. So thank you very much for your time today. And I would love to thank our panelists, Leandro, Ben and Rowan and for your insights and hope everyone found it useful. So look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. Thanks everyone.